This program airs statewide on California Public Television and is a California's Gold Classic. Hi, I'm Huell Hauser, and right now I'm doing something that I have always wanted to do. I'm riding in a blimp. And the reason we're up here over Southern California is that this is the way we're going to get to the first part of this particular adventure. Now, in this adventure, we are going in search of two very unique and unusual and historic types of buildings that are very much a part of our state's landscape. I call this particular episode Huts and Hangers. And as long as you don't get airsick, you're invited to come on along with us. As we all continue our search together, this time in Huts and Hangers for California's Gold. Our first destination was Marine Corps Air Station, Tustin, located in Orange County. And coming in over the base, we quickly spotted, in fact, it was impossible to miss them, the two huge buildings we were on our way to visit. Built in 1942, they still hold the record as the largest wooden structures in the world. They're enormous, even from the air. And to find out why they were built in the first place, you have to go all the way back to the early days of World War II. Uncle Sam revives the dirigible as a defensive weapon. Well, the Navy blimps that patrolled our Pacific coastline during World War II, looking for enemy subs and guarding against invasion, are long gone. But the two wooden hangars built to house those blimps are still very much a part of the Southern California landscape. We thought it'd be interesting to take a close-up look at them, and we arrived in style aboard the Goodyear blimp, which uses one of the giant hangars when it comes in for its annual maintenance and overhaul. Well, after we de-blimped, we were met in front of Hangar 2, and our tour began. Well, now we're going to take a tour of the actual hangar itself, of Hangar 2, and our guides are Lieutenant Commander Hugh Tolford, who was here as an actual blimp pilot back in the 1940s, and Gunny Sweem, who is, your title here is? I'm the Airfield Operations Chief. So you know a lot about these hangars. Oh yeah, we deal with them every day. Okay, we're going to walk inside this wonderful big old hangar, and Mr. Tolford, could you tell us what it was like here back in the 40s? Because didn't you tell me you were here when these things were actually being built? These hangars were under construction when I arrived. And uh, we had to uh, attach the blimps to a, a mobile mast, a uh, triangular mast that was hauled by a tractor. And we sat out on the, on the uh, tarmac out here and, and watch these blimps on a 24-hour basis and on a four-hour shift because the hangars were under construction. So we were here very early and uh, it, was a, it was a great experience because it was wartime and, and you know, standing here today, it, it, makes you, it makes you remember those times 50 years ago, how different it was. Now you must have been amazed watching them being built at the size of these things. It, it, it was just unbelievable to see these, these whole sections go together. You know, people don't realize this building is, is, is 1,100 feet long, it's uh, 300 feet wide, and over 170 feet tall. The blimps that went in this hangar were 290 feet long, they were 80 feet high, and they we were able to get six blimps in this hangar, two blimps at the end and two blimps in the middle and two here. But we always said, but not very, because if the wind was blowing a little bit, we never put more than five blimps into the hangar because that last blimp was very difficult to maneuver it in because they came in tail first and if the wind caught it, it would throw the tail into the, into the rafters above and damage it. And it happened a couple of times, so we were under orders to never put more than five in. But you see, this, this place is worth 
is covers three, what equals three football fields. It's large. Three football fields can fit in here. And six blimps, 290 feet long, could fit in here. Now, is this basically the same wood that it was built with in the 40s? This is the original wood, except for where they've come in and uh, put in replacements uh, or for repair. It's the actual wood. So they built it well. Very well. It's uh, held up to the weather and the earthquakes and everything else. Now, when these hangars were built in 42 and 43, they were revolutionary, weren't they? Yes, they were. They were, they were the first of its kind. That no other building, wood building, had ever built, had ever been this large. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were unique at the time, and they were showplaces for people to see, but unfortunately, they didn't allow the public in here. Yeah, the was, public really never got... They never really got in here, and uh, they, they never rode in a blimp or anything like that. It, we were very isolated here, and you have to remember that at that time, we were surrounded by orange groves and bean fields. Mm -hmm. And all of this construction and all the new housing and the, and the shopping and so on that you see in the roads were not here. Well, I've seen the Goodyear blimp outside the hangar and it looks huge. It looks huge. You put it in here, and it looks like That's one of right. those little That's blimps right. that it they does. fly over a car yeah. dealership That's to let right. you know there's a sale yeah. going on or something. Now, as the captain of the Goodyear blimp, your blimp's in here for repairs, and you're really following in a very proud tradition of having your blimp in here. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the Navy used them for, for years as blimp hangers, and Goodyear's been involved with them since uh, the uh, early 60s. So we've been coming in here almost 30 years now to do our annual maintenance. Now, why do you come here? Is this the only place big enough that's, that's available? It really is. It's funny. You look at this ship behind us, and it looks like a little egg sitting in here right now, but it is the only uh, covered building that's large enough to house it. So they don't make buildings like this anymore? Absolutely not. They're, they're, when this one goes, if it ever does go, there won't be another one. Now, you know, we've been talking about how it looks when it comes in here. Are you ever amazed at how little your blimp looks? Because you're used to being the big guy on the block, and then you pull in here, and you look like a little pipsqueak in here. There are pictures of about <laughs> 12 of these blimps sitting in one of these hangars, uh, and uh, yeah, it is. It is exactly that. It looks so big when it's outside. It looks so small when it's in here. Give me some statistics about this place. Volume and number of trees it took to make it. You know, well, that there's about... 2.7 million board feet of lumber per hangar, uh, over 143 tons of uh, metal and bolts and stringers and washers, etc. cetera. Uh, there's, the surface area is about 7.7 acres. 0.7 acres. 7.7. 7.7 7. 7 acres. Almost 7.7 7 acres here, just on the inside. It's uh, 267 feet from the inside of one building to the other, and then there's 297 feet if you go from the outside to the outside. In other words, it's a big place. It's a big place. <laughs> a whole lot of, they've calculated one time if they cut up all the wood into half inch strips, reach from here to New Zealand and back. And you have fog in here? There you have, you'll have fog to the point you can't see from one end of the hangar to the other. Uh, now we're moving a helicopter right here, so the place is functioning day in and day out. Day in and day out. Uh, there's always something going on in here. Uh, this is kind of interesting. You've got the helicopter, which is what this hangar is used for today, being pulled right by the blimp, right. which is what the what, what thing started, was built for. That's what it started out for as. Do you get a sense of history in here yourself? Oh, yeah. It's, I, we had a uh, ceremony where uh, Paul Gavin lit the hangars up at night with spotlights. Uh, and I was here at that when they did that here back last year. And it's just, it was nice and calm and everything was quiet. And then you're just looking around and it was just almost an eerie feeling, but you'd still walk in. And even after being here for 10 years, you know, you're looking up and the massive size of this place is just unbelievable sometimes. Coming up on the catwalk level now, it runs the whole length of the hangar on both sides so that the, uh, Blimp crews have run their uh, hoisting lines along an I-beam up here, kind of like, runs along like a track. And that's how they get to get up on top of the blimps in and perform their maintenance. Now, what's up, what's up here? 
Okay, this is just a route to go across the top uh, over to the other catwalk here. Well, let's just stay on this side for the time being. Okay. Now we're gonna go down on the original catwalk that was built in uh, 1941. Yeah. And this is the original wood. And I assume that it's sturdy. Oh yeah. I can't There's even no feel no rotten wood here. Yeah, I can't even feel any give through here. Because I gotta tell you, this is a little strange right now. Oh wow. And this is the original wood right here. Now we are almost directly over the blimp. And this is the way that you can really tell how high up we are. Oh yeah, you get a, a good idea of the size. If I remember right, they said it was about 60 feet to the top of their blimp, and we're well over twice that up. So we're about 120, 125 feet up from floor level. Now we are going even higher now. We're going out to the middle. We're going out the to the hangar. very middle of the span. I'm coming. Now, I'm not supposed to look down, am I? Pardon? I'm not supposed to look down, am I? They say it helps. Matt. Wait a minute. There's an owl. Oh, yeah. Look. There you go. That's a smaller one from the one we seen a little while ago. It's right up under the, 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 the metal. Wow. He's just sitting there looking at us. Yeah, he's like, what are you guys doing invading my territory? Oh, man. Oh, God. We're on the top. There are the helicopters. Oh, man. Woo. Well, here we are standing on top of hangar number two, watching the very modern, up-to-date, high-tech helicopters come in. But we could have been standing 50 years ago on top of this exact same hangar and been watching these huge old blimps come in at the end of the day. That's right. The type of aircraft have changed, but the facilities are still in use today. The hangars are still here. That's it. Our next destination was up the coast, about 60 miles northwest of Los Angeles. We were headed for the U.S. Naval Construction Battalion Center at Port Wanimi, home of the Navy's famous Seabees. Now, the Seabees are famous for building things, and one of the most famous and well-known structures they have ever built is the good old Quonset Hut. During World War II, thousands of Quonset Huts were constructed on military bases all over California, and today many still exist including two that have been converted into a CB museum at Port Wanimi, a fitting place to begin our Quonset Hut adventure. They were designed in the spring of 1941 at Quonset Point, Rhode Island. That's the way they got their name. Uh, the Navy needed a prefabricated portable building that it could use overseas at temporary bases during World War II. It wanted something that was light, that would pack in a very small space, that was very easy to erect. And then when the emergency in a particular area was over, could be taken down and moved somewhere else. And the Quonsets filled the bill. Now, how were they invented? How did they come up with the shape and the size and the configuration of a Quonset hut? Okay, basically the shape is based upon a previously existing British military building called the Nissen hut. And the Quonset hut is really a refinement of the Nissen hut. It's kind of a deluxe version. It was made more comfortable with insulation and flooring and whatever. Uh, and then it was designed in various sizes. It could be used for a variety of buildings. It could be used as barracks. It could be used as mess halls. It could be used as hospital wards. It could be used as a chapel. Double-deckered Quonset huts for uh, big barracks buildings, um, warehouses like these big buildings. Uh -huh. uh, almost anything you can think of that might be used as a military at a military base could be made of a Quonset hut. But there was no person named Quonset. No, was, I never heard of anyone named Quonset. There was no Mr. or Mrs. Quonset. <laughs> no, anywhere. it's a geographical term. Quonset Point, Rhode Island, which now, is on Narragansett Bay. Now, I have seen some film. You've, you've loaned us some right, film right. that shows 
a Quonset hut being erected, and it has a little clock out in front, a sequence, right. to show how quickly it right. could actually be built. Right. It came in a kit with everything you needed to erect it. Uh, it came with directions, Quonset hut erection manuals. Uh, if you followed the directions carefully and you had a few carpentry skills, you could put that thing up in record time. Mm -hmm. And the Seabees became very skilled at it at overseas bases. Now, you've also shown me pictures of this base back during World War II. Right. There was literally, there were literally hundreds of, of Quonset huts all in a row. Absolutely. Uh, this base was a sea of Quonset huts during World War II. Since the Seabees, when they were first founded in 1942, were established as a temporary organization for the duration of the war, there was no point in building permanent buildings on a Seabee base. So um, they used Quonset uh, for the barracks, for the mess halls, for uh, the shops, for school buildings, uh, for many of the services like the, uh, the stores and whatever. Now these Quonset huts ended up being used on bases from all the services. Absolutely. Uh, the Seabees did most of the construction for the Marines and they put up Quonset huts on Marine bases. Uh, the Army also used a substantial number of Quonsets during World War II. And they're still around. And they're still around. They are very durable buildings. Now, do you think it surprised everybody how popular they became, how widespread their use actually was? I think the Quonsets are such a modest building. They blend in so much with their environment that people really don't become very much aware of them. Um, if we look around, especially here in Ventura County, where we have a substantial military presence and where the Navy sold a lot of them after World War II, there's still many of them in use. And if you don't think about it, you don't even notice them. Uh, there's one up along Highway 33 that's being used as a muffler shop. Farmers bought a lot of them to use to store their equipment. They're all over the Oxnard Plain. But unless you think a lot about Quonset huts, you don't even, you go by them, you don't think about it. Now we're taking a quick tour of the base. You're going to show me some of the Quonset huts that are still in use here. Yes. Uh, right behind you, you see a Quonset that has been here since World War II and is still in use as an office building. Now that's a big Quonset hut there. That's what a big one. What about this one over okay. here? That isn't really a Quonset hut. It's kind of a modification. As you can tell, it has straight sides. And one of the characteristics of the Quonset is that it is a, sem a cylindrical sort of shape uh, with arch uh, members um, holding up the roof. Okay? So for Quonset hut purist, they know the difference right off between a real Quonset hut right. and an imposter. An imposter, right. <laughs> the imposter has straight sides. Now this is a fine bunch of Quonset huts. Sure is. These are warehouses. They were built in 1944 uh, to store supplies that were coming in on the railroad tracks over there uh -huh. for this space. They've been here ever since then. They are still used as warehouses. They've been reskinned, which means new corrugated siding has been put on them. Reskinned. Reskinned. That's the word the military uses for new corrugated siding for the Quonsets. But other than the reskinning, they're exactly in the shape that they were when they were built in 1944. Now we've had kind of an interesting development here. We've come over to look at this old Quonset hut, and we ran into one of the instructors for the Seabees here today. They're his students back in the back. And you were telling me a little bit about these old Quonset huts. Now, are these legend oh, in the CBs? Yes, sir, they are. They, we started out with the, with the uh, Quonset huts. In fact, uh, that's where it got its name was Quonset up in Rhode Island that uh, uh, originated the name of these huts themselves. Uh, we no longer build these huts. We work on a pre-engineered building, which is based off the same idea that this is constructed with. And uh, they're all put together, pre-cut bolted together. So there's another generation after these? Uh, yes sir there is uh, and what those are we call them uh, PEBs, pre-engineered buildings and uh -huh. those buildings are basically uh, uh, like what we have over over here. Oh okay that's one of the new Quonset hut the, the next generation going on. Yes sir they are uh, they are basically the the same design as these except for a different shape more structurally sound uh, they have just bolt together, everything's already prefabricated. Well now you don't have anything disparaging to say about Quonset huts, do you? Uh, no I don't, not really. It's kind of I... sacrilegious standing here in front of this, this, this wonderful old hut here to be talking about the next generation. The, the thing that, <laughs> that uh, about these is that the floor space. The floor space would be the same as square footage on the ground, but when you stack in boxes or square containers on the inside, of course the space because going up is uh, is diminished, whereas on the, the new ones here, we have straight walls going up. 
Now suddenly we are surrounded by students. There are CBs all over the place. Do you think that any of these young men and women really know <laughs> very much about this grand old thing called a Quonset hut? Well, we try to teach them history of the CBs also. And uh, we have the CB Museum over here, which is a Quonset itself. And uh, there are a lot of pictures and, and memorabilia of the Quonset. If you would uh, go over there and, and just walk through, uh, the CB history goes all the way back. We don't want to lose our, our heritage. And we, we do talk to them and, and teach them about our heritage and where we came from. So what you're saying is, this is definitely a part of your heritage. Oh, yes, sir, it is. Very much so. We had a great day at Port Wanimi, but we had one other stop on our Quonset Hut adventure. We headed south down the coast to Camp Pendleton, the huge Marine Corps base just north of San Diego. Now we went to Camp Pendleton because we'd been told there were a good number of Quonset huts there still being actively used by the Marines. And that turned out to be an understatement. Good afternoon. Hello, Hugh. Mark Tifo is my name. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. We are here to look at Quonset huts in use. And from the look of things, uh, we've come to the right place. You have come to the right place. Here at Camp Pendleton is where the largest concentration of Quonset huts exists in the world. Really? This is where, this is, and this camp here that we're at now is uh, Camp San Mateo, the 52 area aboard Camp Pendleton. And uh, there, this is primarily a school area um, where Marines who are transitioning through combat training, they live and in fact many work in these very Quonset huts that, uh, as we'll see, have been here for, uh, for almost, well, for, for since 1942, we're talking 50 years. So these are the original Quonset huts that were put here uh, back in the, in the early 40s. Absolutely. Uh, this base was opened in, in September of 1942, and at that point was when, uh, in October, was when the first Marines arrived. The, they put up tentage, but shortly after that came the first Quonset huts, and uh, from there, it, the, I think there's now 250 still exist aboard the base. At one point there were more than that, but uh, many have been you know, taken down used for other purposes. Now these are, are holding up pretty good. These are the original, is that's, this, is that's, this metal? It feels almost like fiberglass. That's actually metal. It's uh, galvanized iron. Uh, the Quonset huts are built on uh, metal ribs and wood, what you have is a, it, it's built on the old British Nissen hut, as they called it, a, a design that the British came up with. And it consists of metal ribs that are semicircle shaped and held together with wood. Now, some of these have been modernized. It looks like they've got some, uh, the, well, look at this one. Now, this one looks different, too. It's, it kind of comes out. As you can see, here's a, here's a good look at, this is the beam right here that, that you'll find on all of the quants that's in there. Now, this is an accessory that comes out that gives you some shelter over the end of the Quonset. As you can see on most of the other Quonsets, the normal living areas, they don't have that extension. But it's designed to give you a little shelter from the wind and rain. Gotcha. And this has been kind of plastered, exactly. modernized. This, this is stucco that's been put on here. It used to be in the old days, it was, uh, it was board. They would, and uh, on the inside, on the flooring, is all uh, used to be in the old days, was nothing more than uh, plywood sheeting. These here, Hewell, when these were first built, this was, in this particular camp, these were housing for dependents of Marines because there was such a severe housing shortage out in the neighboring communities. And what they did is you would put two families in, in each of the Quonset huts. Now, if you take a look, for example, this one right here behind us, it's got three windows on it, uh -huh. which indicates that this was officer housing. And in the middle, it would be separated so that you'd have one officer family on each end, you know, in each end of the sharing the hut. And in there, you'd have two bathrooms. You'd have, uh, or excuse me, you'd have one bathroom, two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a living room. Wow. In half of one of these Quonset huts. What is the lifespan of a Quonset hut? Because this is beginning to look a little weathered. Um, well, it's I... obviously been painted and painted and painted. Mm -hmm. How long can these things last? 
I guess, uh, from the marine perspective, it's indefinite. As you know, we take care of the, the buildings that we have because we don't build that fast. It, it costs a lot of money today, so we're going to continue to use these. As a result, hey, we'll put some more stucco on it or we'll, we'll patch them up. But these have been here for, like we say today, it's 52 years so far. And, uh, you know, they seem to be holding up reasonably well and uh, they're yes they're cold in the winter time yes they're hot in the summertime but uh, it beats sleeping under tents or out in the field can we look in here and see what's uh, come on let's take, go in and take a look now there are a lot of bunks in here a lot of racks in here yes sir this, this particular hooch has 31 they go up to 32 uh, we'll have companies up to 500 men and a limited number of hooches so we have to fit them in uh, We've tried all kind of rearranging the furniture, but this is the best configuration to get the most Marines in and give them the space they need. So you've got them, come on, let's go down here. You've really got them squeezed in this place. Pretty tight, pretty tight. You understand, don't you, that these things have been part of the core for a long time? Yes, I've seen them on TV and stuff like that, movies and stuff, yeah. I noticed that. And now you're living in one. Right, get to be a part of history. <laughs> That's a very way. positive way of looking at it. <laughs> yes. I would think that there are literally thousands of people watching this program who have been through the military, who have spent time in these Quonset huts, and I would think that every one of them has a Quonset hut story <laughs> to tell, and I'm not sure that it would all be positive. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> yes, indeed. There's, there's stories of, uh, you know, of hardships, and, uh, but it, like I say, it still beats living outside uh, you know, under, under tents or uh, living out in the field with your, underneath your poncho. They've stood the test of time, and here they are. Yeah, the good old Quonset hut. <laughs> there it is, the good old Quonset hut. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, I hope you enjoyed our visit to the hangars and the huts. These buildings interesting not only from an architectural standpoint, but they're also very much a part of our state's history. And on a personal note, as a former Marine who spent more than my fair share of time living in one of these old Quonset huts, I can tell you that it was a lot of fun coming back here today and seeing them again up close. But believe me, living in a Quonset hut, it's one of those experiences I'm glad I had and moved on from. <laughs> well, as we close this adventure, as always, we thank you for joining us and invite you to come on along with us again next time as we all continue our search together for California's gold. Goodbye, everybody. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again or share it with your family or friends, all you have to do is call 1-800- 2665727 and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.